Welcome back to Cancer Buzz TV. I'm your host, Summer Johnson. On this show, we aim to bring you the news and the latest issues in cancer care you need to know. Today, the second in our Returning to Practice series, with a focus on the current environment for patients with chronic lymphocytic leukemia. There's still a lot of uncertainty for these patients regarding the virus because they're at an increased risk for COVID-19 and they may not respond as well to the vaccine. Here today, Dr. John Allen, he's an assistant professor of medicine in hematology and medical oncology at Weill Cornell. Dr. Mark Fessler, he's the director of the Bone Marrow Transplant Program and a professor of internal medicine at St. Louis University in Missouri. And Dr. Susanna Fremel, she's the owner and president of Iowa Cancer Specialists, PC, in Davenport, Iowa. The first thing we're going to tackle is how are you talking about COVID-19 vaccination efficacy with your patients with CLL? Dr. Fremel, let's start with you. Well, Summer, in general, um, when you have the B lymphocytes depleted or malfunctioning as they do in CLL, then vaccine responses um, are not ideal. And so I don't think we know exactly, I don't know if there's been studies that show exactly um, what percentage of patients will respond to certain vaccines, COVID and otherwise. Uh, but in general, we do let patients know that likely they will not have uh, an optimal uh, response to vaccination. Dr. Allen? Yeah, it's a, it's a hot topic. All patients are really interested in, in understanding their response to uh, the vaccination, uh, as well as what implications the antibodies that they may or may not develop have on their life and, and how do they get back to uh, some semblance of normality. So it's a it's a topic that almost every patient that I have an encounter encounter with uh, we have a discussion, and um, you know it's something that is uh, a little bit nuanced and and I think patients take it differently depending on their levels of anxiety and what their expectations that they have set for themselves uh, are. Um, but ultimately we kind of go over the data and what's available at the time. And, you know, in this pandemic, it's it's almost every six months we have to reset our thinking and our thoughts based on the emerging evidence and the data that's coming out. And, you know, that's really what a lot of these discussions are. And so uh, I have the same patient six months later, I sometimes have a very different discussion with and, and we just kind of update uh, everyone where we stand in the current current day. Dr. Fessler. Yeah, I think it creates some challenges because, um, you know, I think psychologically and socially, um, you know, we're all um, wanting this pandemic to be over. And I think that the patients are, are wanting to, um, to do social things, do stuff with their families, uh, you know, go to restaurants, kind of resume normal activities. And I think that because we know that they have worse outcomes when they get the COVID illness, it becomes a difficult situation to discuss the risks and benefits of, you know, what would be acceptable from a health risk perspective as it pertains to COVID now. Dr. Allen, with the current lack of evidence-based information, how do you engage patients in shared decision-making? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, it's important to note that there there is more emerging data out there. There are some uh, updates uh, recently published this past month, uh, earlier in June, uh, which are really showing us who uh, who is going to make antibodies. It's also what's important that came out of some of these publications is that it's talking to us about the timing of when people are making antibodies in relation to their recent treatment and specifically what type of treatments that patients are making antibodies with or without. Specifically anti-CD20s, it appears that no one is really making antibodies and my anecdotal experience on top of what's been published uh, kind of agrees with that. So obviously patients are very anxious about this. They really wanted to have these discussions in terms of this shared decision-making, kind of everyone is involved with it in our team. Our, my physician assistants that I work with, our mid-levels, our research nurses, 
um, as well as the physicians and myself. I mean, patients ultimately kind of want to hear from their doctor, um, but there's a lot of emails coming through the portals and the, and and just directly to me as well, uh, as well as to my uh, mid-level kind of physician extenders. And so we're all kind of well-versed on this data. We kind of talk about it. Um, you know, outside of, you know, clinic and kind of preparing everyone for some of these answers and, uh, and, and to these questions. And so, you know, it's really a team effort. Um, I think patients want to hear from multiple opinions ultimately. And, um, you know, as we continue to get data, we get more information, we're able to share it and we do it. Um, and it, and it's really this team effort that everyone's coming together to, to provide this information to our patients whenever they reach out and, and ask for it. Dr. Fessler? Yeah, I typically will share with them the, the published studies as we know them in regards to vaccine efficacy. And, you know, typically we'll engage in a discussion of kind of what things they've been not doing and what things that they are desiring to do in the next three, six, let's say 12 months. And depending on that, we we'll kind of discuss more granular things about, well, does it make sense right now from a psychological benefit perspective versus a harm related to COVID exposure to travel? Are there risks more with air travel or uh, vehicle tra- motor vehicle travel? So we kind of engage in those types of discussions. And you know, I think without having a firm evidence base, it becomes difficult, but I try to engage them as much in the process because you know, the overall quality of life for somebody um, really, you know, has to take in multiple domains and it's not just, uh, not just their illness. There's a lot of conflicting information, of course, about the vaccine and these patients on the internet. Do you address this with patients and are there resources that you do direct them to? Yeah, I think that, you know, um, the the difficulty is finding reliable websites and you know we'll we'll tep- typically uh you know recommend um national cancer care websites uh websites of you know various academic organizations that can be helpful for them to look at i think that you know just staying away from general google searches um general web browsers is is typically what i'll recommend Dr. Allen, I'd like to talk about enrollment in CLL clinical trials. Has this been affected by uncertainty around the vaccine for patients with CLL? Yeah, initially, obviously, early in the pandemic, uh, things shut down, clinical trial enrollment shut down uh, in terms of, you know, new people coming on to study uh, with uh, the pandemic escalating, you know, a lot of memos went out and studies amended uh, to allow virtual visits and, and those patients who were already on clinical trial uh, to kind of continue on the study activities and procedures and such. And so in terms of the patients on study, you know, there was really no interruption in treatment necessarily, uh, but there was definitely uh, a difference in how we enacted and provided the care and mostly through telehealth and, and video visits, etc. mailing, you know, study drugs to patients and, and you know, getting emailed back scanned copies of diaries and things like this because patients weren't coming on site. Um, for the most part, it would it wasn't too impacted. Scans could be done uh, kind of at their when when it was safe, etc. So we got information and, and safety data and all these things. But uh, at at this point in time, you know, as as the virus um, prevalence has dramatically decreased with our vaccination efforts, you know, the trial enrollments have opened back up. Uh, patients are feeling more comfortable to enroll on a study if they believe it's the best for them. And, you know, it's kind of swung, the pendulum has swung back towards uh, thinking less about how COVID might impact someone's treatment and really trying to choose the right therapy or the right approach or the right clinical trial for the patient if they're eligible and if it's the right thing for them without thinking too much of how COVID might impact that. At least that's been in my practice. 
I'm thinking less and less about what what COVID may do for the you know have in the patient's treatment um, regarding some therapy we might use anti CD20. Although with that said, when I'm off of a study, these these thoughts come into my mind. These discussions come in with our patients uh, on the potential treatment that we provide and its effect on you know some immune response that they may have if they were to be infected. Dr. Freemel, what do we need to keep in mind about treating CLL right now? Well, I mean, I think that there's so many different um, initial therapies available. Uh, so if somebody needs treatment, um, there's always the question of should we put them on something oral where they can, you know, don't have to come to the clinic all the time or something where they have to come to the clinic. But you have to understand, even if you start an oral medicine, the patients still need to have lab work. They still have to get out and go to a lab. Um, so we really haven't changed our practice, uh, you know, completely based on COVID. However, we definitely counsel our patients to uh, never touch their face with their hands, always wash their hands and keep them sanitized, you know, be really cognizant about wearing a mask around when you're around other individuals. And so that's what they've been doing. Dr. Allen, what's your best advice? I think it's important to treat the disease um, without too much thought about how COVID may impact that decision because there might be a treatment approach uh, that is best fit for the patient in front of you, a fixed duration approach potentially for a younger patient, etc., cetera, um, or uh, someone who you may not want to give an anti-CD20 because they've had a lot of infections or they may have even had COVID in the past, etc., and you want to preserve as best you can those antibody, uh, that antibody response, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, it may impact uh, when you decide to vaccinate a patient um, uh, after some type of treatment, potentially as data is starting to merge, uh, as we understand that a little bit better. So ultimately, I think, though, what we have to do is remember CLL is, is a malignancy. It is a cancer, and we need to really uh, use the best treatment for the patient. Fortunately, there's a lot of different options that give a lot of flexibility to uh, tr physicians treating patients, and, and they have um, uh, numerous options that, that uh, are all very, very effective and have a lot of pros and cons to each approach. And, and I think ultimately we should not let COVID necessarily get in the way of that if there is a specific approach that we want to use for a patient uh, for the potential hypothetical risk uh, into the future, unknown future that COVID may, may pose. How about you, Dr. Fessler? Any final thoughts? Yeah, I think that, you know, right now we are, we are not out of the pandemic and we're hearing more and more about variants um, in the news. And I think that, you know, the impact of those variants we don't really know for certain. And I think for patients with CLL, um, it, it really argues for a conservative approach to um, their exposure right now because we do know the illness can be worse in those patients. And I think for practitioners, it really becomes key to make a global assessment of the patient and decide, you know, relative risks versus benefits of our treatments. And I think that you know, maybe using an anti-CD20 antibody uh, might carry some uh, additional harms that, you know, on a relative scale are not needed. Um, it may be that some of the oral therapies are better tolerated from an immune perspective than our older chemotherapies. And I think the field was moving that direction. I think the pandemic actually probably accelerated that move to using um, some of the novel oral therapies. So I think those would be the main considerations. Thank you, Drs. Allen, Fessler, and Freemol. For more resources on treating patients with CLL and more of the Returning to Practice series, you can head over to the ACCC website at accc-cancer.org. Funding and support for this show is provided by AbbVie. On behalf of all of us here at Cancer Buzz TV, thank you for watching. I'm Summer Johnson.